क्या योग है Okay, just to give you an overview of what the we expectations will be. There are six major components to putting together a model. You got to build a model. You can move to the next one, um, and you will learn this if you don't memorize it right off the bat. Income statement. Cash flow. Income statement, cash statement, balance sheet, major schedules, major components. There are some helper schedules that help the flow and continuity of the firm, including depreciation. I call it, I call it DNA, depreciation amortization, working capital. Uh, cash flow, sorry, balance sheet, that's good. You will know these very well. Okay, so these, um, you're going to have to get used to my These six components are the core structures um, and for the first week, each structure is a topic. Right? So the first day, that went down and didn't turn on. The first day, you will learn about the agency. So today, you spend, I should have brought pens. You would spend two hours today learning about how to fix the other there's a chapter in the book about these things. So the homework is going to be to read that chapter. And my recommendation is this. Your trainer's movie, Nate Klein. Nate Klein spent quite a few years in Merrill Lynch in M&A. He went over to Fortress. Very smart guy. Almost too smart. He goes fast. So you guys are going to keep up. And you guys are going to feel lost. And that's totally normal. That's what this is for. My recommendation is the model I sent you guys, the template, save two versions. Save an in-class version and a home version. Keep the pace of Nate as best you can, and then save another one and say, can I really repeat this on my own? And the whole point of the book is it pages through and steps through how to build the model. Right? It's a lot the first few chapters. It's like 40 pages. So you got to manage your time. You know, you're going to go, we're going to do this till 1 o'clock. Yeah, you're going to have a little bit of time for lunch, whatever. You're going to go get, you're going to go to the firm, you're going to get staff. They're going to get their assignments, and they're going to understand your first day. You're going to have to work a little bit of your assignments, and then carve out one or two hours to go through this chapter on your own. Now, it's going to be a lot of stuff. It's going to be a long day, the first day. Okay. Tomorrow, cash flow statement, another large schedule. Right. How do you build the whole cash flow statement? You're going to go two hours into that tomorrow. It's going to be an earlier day, right? It's on a long four hour day. You're going to go back to the firm. You're going to kind of get more acquainted. Okay? No matter what you get staffed on, guarantee you're going to have to build a model. And guarantee if you're building a model, you're going to have to put together an industry. That's how this program kind of works. So no matter what you're going to get staffed on, this is why I tell Biasol and I tell Julio, all the managing directors, staff them on anything that's transactional. I know the first step is always going to be build a model and that's going to be a build industry. It's kind of, you know, slowly get to see how the program kind of works, right? So I know you're going to go into the income statement. So I know income statement is the natural first stop. Yeah? Next is cash flow. How does the other cash statement? It's going to be a lot. There's no big chapter on it. So make sure you carve time to read that. And you guys are going to get it the first time. But Chuck, this is one of many, many models we will build in class. It's one of mock and simulated deals that we will do in class that you will use to be very productive on the real stuff that you're working on. So don't worry. Don't worry about this stuff. Wednesday, depreciation schedule. Now, this is a mini kind of schedule. It's a shorter chapter. It's not one of the big major statements. So maybe will there be two hours training on it? You know, maybe you'll want to review it for like an hour. So you'll have time. You're slowly starting to realize that you're going to have time to pick up and all the stuff that you might feel long to do. Thursday, working capital. 
At this point, you're probably going to start to hit deadlines in your transactions. And then people come in and talk to you about these deadlines in your transactions. I want to see a model by Thursday. So, but this time, you'll have enough. You know, you'll, you'll be working with other people, they will work on teams, and you'll be guided to work with. You know? Friday is no plan. So, this is a great time to finish what you're doing with, with Ferber and with work to kind of make the company present it. You know, admittedly, some of these guys, you know, once they come out on Friday, they're not going to stay too long. We have plenty of time to catch up on all of these work. Some people don't get to the reading in the home. That's fine. Save it for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday, some guys are coming in just to kind of have study groups and meeting groups. You have three full days to catch up on all of this work. You know, that's kind of how it works. You know? Next week's last major schedule, balance sheet. The balance sheet, balance in the model will learn is such a huge major component. <coughs> yeah. Then the final piece, debt schedule. And probably by this time, by Wednesday, Kerber is going to kind of ask, well, I want to see, or whoever, I want to, I want to see a final model. You know, well, luckily Wednesday, this model scenario adjustment, this is kind of soft skills. This isn't a major kind of new, you know, thing to learn. You know, so even though the learning curve time, you're getting thrown out a lot of information, there's going to be some soft lectures, but my, my point is still come to them because they're going to be done. So Wednesday, you'll have time to catch up. You'll have time to kind of sniff up your models. Thursday, evaluation and trial, a little bit soft skills. We're talking, you're going to have a lot of time to catch up on how to build a model. One of the first two weeks is about how to build a model. And what I've, what I've coached before I'm just going to, oops, come on. Oh, is that better? Okay. But I've coached the firms to, to say, make sure they're building models, or make sure they're building models on the first week, make sure the deadline for the model building is by the end of the second week. But I've, I've, I've given them that guidelines. Then we're getting to evaluation. So you will soon realize, we'll do some training that the deals that you're working on always involves valuing and ending. Whether you're buying a business, selling a business, but you have to value the energy first. So you still get into that. Build a model on the business. Then valuation, then valuing right? comparable companies now. This kind of cash flow. There's, there's a cash flow need. Same kind of things go, but it's not going to be as intense. So my point is, very intensive first couple days. Once you absorb that, you're really going to realize how much you've learned. And the next point is, um, you're going to feel lost, and that's okay. You're going to even feel lost until week six. You're not going to know what you're working on. You're not going to know what it's about. These deals take sometimes two years to complete. So you shouldn't expect yourself to know that. But you should be at some point, at least by the end of the end of the program, think back and say, let me reflect on this and let me talk out with Paul what I was doing so I can kind of explain it well in an interview. I don't expect you guys to kind of absorb that and understand it in six weeks. It doesn't take six weeks. That's a tough thing to teach, you know, the ins and outs of the deal. Imagine directors have years in the business. So don't you know, worry about that. You know, we'll, we'll talk it out. You know, making sure each of you guys can understand what you're doing is part of this process. Okay, one, uh, I guess the first topic that will hopefully be helpful for you guys um, is what's, what's the structure of the home? You guys should really know um, where you want to be and why. This is helpful for yourself, helpful to understand how that might come together. And helpful for you to know when people ask, well, why is it that? I don't think you're going to do the cancer. That's what this is about. There are perfect answers, in my opinion. And only you guys know it. I was part of NYU recruiting from Morgan Stanley. We went, we went through 800 resumes. I have now done 10, 15 years. I know the questions that are asked. So, it's up there. I'll draw it. First thing with banks, I like to think of a pyramid. As you go down, it's more popular with people. The top is firm management, CEO, CFO, guys that run the company, small part of the pyramid, less people. Okay. Um, if you're an investment banking, there could be a rotation in firm management. I did one. Uh, we kind of get to see their high profile kind of thing that stuff. So, you know, not the most exciting thing, but that is the worst trying I could ever do. Um, <laughs> next is investment bank. Investment bank department, IBD. Right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little 
part out here because it's segmented. Right? The investment banking department is divided into products, divided into sectors. And sectors are industry groups. I've asked everybody there any specific industry group that's interesting for you. Right? Do you like energy? Do you like technology? Do you like media? Right? But it's important to understand the products. There's M&A, capital markets, and coverage. So when people say, what is investment bank? The first thing you should say is investment banking is two things. There's M&A or underwriting. Right? Investment is M&A or underwriting, right? M&A is buying or selling companies or clients. Underwriting is raising equity, right? raising debt for a client. And who handles that? Well, the M&A group handles M&A, and the capital markets handle underwriting. But people need to go out and get business from the bank. Those are the real investment bankers. Those are the coverage guys. They're salesmen. That's the investment bank is sales. You're selling a service. The service that you're selling is M&A or underwriting. That's called coverage. Right? And coverage is broken up in industry sectors. So if, you're, if somebody's saying, oh, I'm working in the you know, consumer products group, they're doing coverage. And what do you do as an analyst in coverage? You put together presentations. You put together presentations that explain to a CEO or board of directors of a firm why you should buy a company, sell a company, or raise equity in this stuff. M&A markets, uh, this is a great time to buy the, the companies are undervalued, or this is a great time to raise equity, you have to put it, you're overvalued. We'll talk about how, how that works. So a coverage officer, a good managing director, spends their time getting in front of board of directors and trying to sell business for the firm. And you're putting together a presentation that represent that. Okay. Um, that's all it is. Right. So coverage is divided up into several sectors. There's media, whatever, I'm just talking about energy, uh, fixed FIG, fixed income, which are banks, banking of banks, uh, transportation, yeah, it's coverage. Then there's products. There's M&A as a product. And there's capital markets. And this is why most analysts, if they get an offer, um, walk to work in one bank because those are the guys that go the MBA box. Most heavily. Way back when I was in banking, there was only a select number of private equity firms, and the best private equity firms would only hire at the MBA box. I mean, the MBA groups of the firms. You've got to do that net. Now that's softened a little bit because there's a lot of private equity firms, but the THC, the arm that I was at, the Carl, all these firms, they would only hire out of, and that, that's why back then people always saw, I said, well, I want to be banking and more private equity. Now you can kind of get around it, get a good model. Um, and then capital markets, equity capital markets, ECMS, they call it, debt capital markets, ECMS. So a managing director would put together a presentation saying, company, whatever, um, now is the time to raise equity. Or now is the time to buy this business. And the company says, well, no, I'm interested in, in buying maybe a business. Can you show me some companies that I can buy? John goes to the M&A team. M&A team looks for companies, hunts for targets, builds models on what would be the financial impact if company A bought company B, brings it to the next presentation. If the company says, no, no, I'd like to raise equity, it would be John goes to the equity capital markets group, and capital markets puts together a section of the presentation, builds a model on, on the business, and says, well, the company would raise equity. This is what the company would look like. This is in the presentation. The coverage officer goes back and makes another presentation. That's how it works. <coughs> so, one one lesson here is, or let me just one other anecdote. Um, sometimes, some of these groups, let's say energy, for example, do their own M and A. It just depends on the relationship. Depends on the firm structure. Sometimes, maybe it's because of the relationships the nine directors have with firms, or maybe it's because energy has a little bit of a specific way of doing things that, that's different than what a generalist and a many person would know. So, in my opinion, ideally, if you were to work for a group that does coverage and M&A, 
And it's almost better than working just for the neighbor because you get to see both sides of it. So one kind of secret to point out is, and make it look smart in interviews, if you're interviewing for a group, ask them to do their own MA. To make it look smart, to make it look right, you didn't know that stuff. I never got it. I really got asked that question when I was when I was um, recruiting, right, for Morgan Stanley. Um, they people just didn't know. They didn't know enough about the next and how to get there. So and it's a good experience because you get you get to see the coverage side, which is kind of exciting the fun set, especially if there's an IPO, you know. Um, you know, you literally get access to a bunch of debt for your kind books. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's kind of fun seeing them kind of. <laughs> um, and then you, get, then you get the modeling of MMA. So you, you get the recruiting, the recruitment capabilities of those kind of. Um, I hate to say this, but equity never works that kind of market. It's typically known as the least technical of everything. So if you have a choice, steer away from it. Sometimes you can use that as an advantage because sometimes, depending on the way that the banks hire, everybody wants to do a mix. If you say you only want to do a mix, that's all right. We'll do the best, 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 you know, increase your competition. Sometimes it can be advantageous to say, well, let me, let me say I really want to get that we have a market because nobody does that, and I'll get that offer and then slowly shift. You know, so there's strategies at play. We'll talk about that. Okay, that's how you did. Um, <clears throat> Then we have skeleton training. So, so let's say coverage officer, coverage officer, those that we got the market says this company may want to do next grade. We put together a presentation and see what the market is like, put together comps, all this stuff. And then, um, the client likes it. I said, I want to, I want to do that equity rate. Who executes it? Trips. Sales guys, what they call them, run their books. They're book runners, which means they call up their clients, they call them and say, hey, we have to buy sales from now, you know, or whatever, secondary offering, whatever. Would you be interested in how much will you buy? And they create a book, which is a list of all interested parties to help determine the demand. And then the trader next. Look at this one's how the These days, trading is all them years, your match. So it's like a video game, really. The list of prices, buys, and you have match sellers and buyers. Um, interesting to note, I just said matching sellers and buyers. Any of these roles, pretty much, is dealing with matching buyers and sellers and stuff. That's what the best bank does. You're, you're, you're in, a, in a very high end way, you're a coverage officer, you're finding a buyer in the company, you're a seller in the company. Or a buyer of an IPO, you sell it. You sell it, 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 you where they're protected from communicating with the other firms, just laws that have evolved over time. We'll talk more about that in more detail, but equity research creates reports evaluating the price of the business. The way equity research reports. Some people express interest in equity research. There's a fund that's participating with us. They're, they've been around about 100 years. Um, they do asset management, they do equity research. They do the hedge fund work. So you guys work in the hedge fund arm, but um, there's an equity research component to that. So building a model of the business, valuing the business, coming come up with a report that determines what the price is. And with this company, we had interns put together a report and the report was published and the name was on it. It's really cool. So we like equity research. Benefits of equity research for an analog, you're still modeling. It's not an intensive model. Hours are great. You're still making Investment banking salaries, you're not making the bonuses here, but it's still a good salary, good career. Um, it's just the modeling isn't as intensive. You're still doing modeling, you're still evaluating the business. Well, that might be something to consider. Then there's asset management, managing funds. Sorry, I'm here. Asset management. 
Managing funds, <laughs> a multitude of different types of asset management, funds of funds to just different portfolios, hedge funds, all different types of funds. It's just taking people's money and investing. I laugh because it just sounds kind of crass, but no, I mean, the point is to invest in something greater. And then, and this is just a rough diagram, of the infrastructure, and then there's brokerage, right? Brokers, real sales guys, trying to bring in money into the firm. Yeah. To land, to land, make commission. Yeah. So, boutique firms, and now there's boutique firms everywhere. But 20 years ago, the ideal career was to go into an investment bank and get the skill so you can be considered for a private equity firm or a boutique firm because the boutique firms do what the investment banks do but on a smaller scale. So they usually just focus on the nice thing about a boutique firm is they don't really have to do coverage. They're boutique because they have a selected client that they've known for many, many years. And some of you guys think, wow, this is a pretty big deal. How does this boutique firm have relationships with these deals? Well, the thing is that if you're working for a Fortune 500 company, and where you're going to be, they work for Fortune 500 companies, which is awesome. But and in a bulge bracket bank, when you do an M&A for a Fortune 500 company, you're doing like a billion dollar acquisition, or you're doing like you know a, a billion dollar acquisition. In order to survive, companies a lot of times need to continually to pursue M&A activity, and they constantly pursue acquisitions at smaller firms that are under maybe 250 million. And arguably, both recognized banks don't want to deal with that. It's under their radar of you know, fees that they would want. For. Do they want that billion dollars? Yeah. But who doesn't? That's the boutique firms. So you'll get you know, a bulge, you know, let's say Walmart, for example, may have 20 different boutique firms that are each pursuing different strategic areas of you know, retail stores in the Midwest. And you look at retail stores in the country. So they can kind of look at who's out there and look at acquiring a lot of little firms to help increase their market share. And that's what these guys do. They can be at one forty. They're pursuing, even though you're working with big companies, I guess there's a lot more half of the action you're working with, they're pursuing smaller transactions that are under the radar of both of them. What makes it perfect for you guys is the process is exactly the same as the process you've learned in an investment bank. So you can go to with your resume, you can go to an investment bank and say, I, I've done all the steps to be an analyst from start to finish. No one else is going to have that. You know? um, I've put together a set of comps the right way. I've built a model. I didn't shadow another analyst like, like you would do in a bowling record back and just get research for him. I did. I was the analyst on the day. Right? I put together a presentation, a digital presentation, presenting like the findings to the board. You, know, you probably won't present it yourself, but you'll put together a presentation and then reject it yourself. You'll go through all the box checks that are requirements that are approved to an expert. And that's the point. Okay, another thing that causes some confusion when I want to talk about the differences is buy side versus sell side. What's buy side and what's sell side? And the, the reason why it causes confusion is because there's two types of buy side versus sell side. It's confusing, it's a lot of information. I guess I'm going to go through this and we'll forget it. I think we're going to go through this again. And I don't mean that in that I wasn't trying to be, but the whole point is there's still a lot of information on the big tech. But I'll just go through it now. We'll go through it again. Um, first of all, there's buy side versus sell side firms. Well, what's a buy side versus sell side firm? Well, anybody know? Buy side versus sell side? Yes. Go ahead. Well, buy side versus sell side firms. Okay, yeah. that's, that's, uh, in the most fundamental level, that's exactly right. So, and, and an investment bank is a sell side firm. They sell a service, they're selling a service. Whether it's a M&A, it's a M&A bus. Right? Um, a buy side firm makes investments for themselves. It's a fund, hedge funds, a venture firm. They're considered buy side because not only are you 
doing MA work and building models and value businesses. You're not doing it for somebody else, you're doing it for yourself. You're investing in business. So hopefully you get a return. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to start with the sell side and start with the buy side. Because the sell side, you learn the skills. When you're working with a lot of clients, you're building all these models, you're really building a good foundation on the sell side. Then on the buy side, then you're using that foundation to try to generate a return for your fund. Now, where that gets a little bit confusing is, there are M&A deals that you'll be working on where you would play a buy side role or a sell side role. A different type of buy side versus sell side. It confuses people. Well, wait a minute. I'm working on a buy side firm, but I'm working on the sell side. What does that mean? So let me just try to start. So buy side versus sell side type of firm. Buy side firm, invest money. Sell side firm, your service. Here we are the full service investment. There's their service. There are some exceptions, but this is generally the, the, the core role. But on a deal, um, and let's say Walmart, for example. Let's say Walmart <coughs> is, is going to buy Costco. Or let's say it's somebody small. I don't know if it's a small. So let's just say retail chain. Retail X. I'm not creative. If Walmart is looking to purchase retail chain A, if you are a bank representing Walmart, you're on the buy side. You're representing the buyer. If you're a bank representing retail A, you're on the sell side. You're representing the telephone. company. And so, in a in a in a in a in an M and A deal, there's always banks are going to buy the buyers and the banks are going to sell, and you got to pick a side. Sometimes in these smaller deals, they might get complicated and you don't know where you're on the buy side. So I sometimes get blind to them. Am I going to sell myself to somebody else or should I acquire other businesses? Should I spin off or put off? And part of what you're doing in MA is understanding the key to golf parameters to figure out what is the best path for the company. Your job is to, to find that advice. So you might not know if you're on the buy side or sell side until the, the client has settled on some specific type of advice. When you get assigned an M&A deal, the assignment is at some stage of the process of looking for companies to buy or acquire. Right? And so you would either be at the very early stage of the deal, which means you don't even know what companies you want to buy, which means you're going to be putting together a presentation, you'll be looking for companies, or you would be looking for yourself, the managing director knows some companies, you'd be evaluating those companies, are those the right targets? Right, and put your presentation saying here's company A, B, C, D. These are the plus and minuses of each. Or you might be at the later stage of a deal, meaning the company's already identified a target. You just want to make sure once integrated, the company would survive. There are all different stages of the deals. The point is, as long as you're at the point of the deal where you're building a model, put together a comp, put together a presentation, that's what you want to do. Five five versus five. So we'll learn more about this as time goes on. And I think this is a perfect point to pass it off to the actual firm. I want to bring some people in. I want to introduce you to some of these guys. Um, hopefully they're here. Let's take a quick five minutes. Maybe great time to go outside, get some water. Um, I want to have these guys for, you know, maybe 30 minutes, introduce themselves. You know, here is the best time to introduce you guys, to address you guys as a group. Then from 11 to 1, you're going to do income statements. And then I'll have you guys report to 1.40 at by 2 o'clock for your session. Yeah? Good.